All good to go. Well, good evening, everybody. It is good to be with you again for another fantastic session on the subject of leadership. It has been said, and it is true that everything rises and everything falls on leadership. Imagine Jesus found a solution as to how his church was going to grow and become what it is today, a global phenomenon. He took 12 men aside and he led them and he taught them. And when he was done with them, one man said, before he ascended, they asked him, Lord, what about if plan A fails? What's, what's plan B? To which the Lord replied, now this never happened, so don't go quoting it as though it's scripture. To which the Lord replied, I have no other plan. Because he was so sure of plan A, there was no need for him to incorporate plan B and uh, et cetera, et cetera. He did a good job leading those men and training those men and imparting to those men and impacting those men that the church became what it is today because his plan did not fail. And we have got to come to that realization, to that understanding that no matter our occupation, God has ordained us to be leader. Let me say that again. No matter your occupation, no matter what you're doing for a living to earn cash, God has ordained us all, all of us, to be leaders. And today, what we see is our world is full of leaders, but it is not full of leadership. A lot of what we call leaders are mere managers. They're not visionary, they just maintain what they have. But God has and is raising up a new breed, a new type, a new genome of people that are going to be the solution to the problems of leaders and leadership. And so today we have, once again, to our delight, <laughs> Apostle Von der Gaspar. We had Dr. Kwame Gilbert the last time the last two sessions, and we had her the last two sessions after he was done. And uh, it is always good to add to the mix, to add the flavor. And she is bringing the female king to the flavor and to the table. <laughs> Blessed us the last time she was here, and I'm sure it will be no different. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Apostle Von der Gaspar as he comes to minister the word of God. Now, I need to let you know we are going to go beyond the one hour limit and the, our 15 minutes limit. We are going until we got nothing else to say. So God bless, here she comes to the table. Give her a good round of applause. Ooh. Bravo, bravo, God bless her. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Clearly, loud and clear. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, uh, thank you so much, Apostle, for that welcome. It is truly an honor to be here tonight. And as you said, there are many, many leaders in the world. There is, there is no shortage of leaders, but very, very little leadership is happening. And even at this time, there is a leadership crisis going on where uh, people are looking for leadership, good leadership, sound leadership, godly leadership. And it's here. And so um, when, when you can find a leader who is uh, up to par uh, with the principles of God, up to par, and, and, and let me stick a pin here, there are leaders out there who don't know God, but have found their way to tap into some of the principles, the biblical principles of leadership. And when you find them, you realize that, uh, something God has somehow injected him, himself into um, their style of leadership, and it is revolutionary. And so I want to begin tonight by saying that the term, and I'm continuing 
from where I left off last week. I dealt with uh, servant leadership last week and I showed examples, two specific examples of servant leadership. And the first one was Moses and the way he dealt with his people, the way he, um, uh, he stood up for his people, the way he advocated for them before God. And the second was Jesus Christ, the way uh, he served his disciples by getting down low, sitting even below them physically and washing their feet. And, and, and all of what that implied that uh, even as he washed their feet, that he was showing his humility, even though he was a leader, he was showing his humility. And so tonight I wanna to continue by uh, uh, delving a little deeper into servant leadership, especially in the area of servant leadership in the world that we are living in, whether it's practically in the church or in the office. And so I'll be vacillating between, <clears throat> excuse me, between the two. Sometimes I'll be referring to the church and sometimes I'll be, be referring to office. You will also hear me talk about employees and teams and organization and ministry, uh, church membership and congregation. So these are all terms that I'm going to use along the way. So the term servant leadership, which basically refers to the servant leading or the person who sees himself as a servant, but also functions in the capacity uh, of, a, of a leader. Servant leadership is a style of leadership, which, base, which is based on the idea that leaders prioritize serving the greater good, the greater vision, which at the same time, and while at the same time, simultaneously attending to the growth and development of their team. So the servant leader looks at the overall uh, um, overarching purpose of why they're leading. And then at the same time, they are also attending to the needs of the people that they are leading. And so it, this, this is considered one of the most difficult styles of leading or, or of leadership because it, 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 it focuses on leading out front as well as leading from behind. And a lot of times it's very difficult because it's a delicate dance because you have to attend to your people and the needs of your people as well as uh, make sure that you accomplish the goals that you have set, whether it's for your organization or, or for your, your ministry team or whatever, where, whatever group you're leading. And so leaders with this style, which is the servant leadership style, serve their team and organization first. They do not prioritize their own objectives. I didn't say they don't prioritize their own needs. They don't prioritize their own objectives. A little more volume. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Sorry for that. Yes. So they don't prioritize their own objectives, uh, but they prioritize, uh, or, or, or that doesn't mean that they don't prioritize their own needs. Needs and objectives are two, two different things. Uh, but they, they, they just, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. So they look at the, 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 their objectives, they put that aside and they, they bring their team together to, to bring everybody's uh, ideas together. That's what I wanted to say. So it's not about their objective being in the forefront. It's not about them and, and what they want to say being at the forefront, but merely and mostly and more importantly, it's what the team brings to the table uh, to fulfill the goals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Servant leadership seeks to achieve a vision by providing strong support to their team, to their member or ministry members. And so, you know, the thing about leadership is that when when you when you're leading, people have a, a, a 
they romantic, romanticize leadership as though it's something, uh, you know, something fantastic. And there are perks to leadership, but understand this, that leadership is hard work. Leadership is not about somebody taking your briefcase and combing your hair and attending to your needs. Leadership is, as it said, leading. And in the process of doing that, sometimes it becomes very, very difficult. And so uh, a, a servant leader seeks, to, seeks to, to, to achieve the vision by providing strong support to his team or to her team or to his ministry team or to, to, the, to the congregation or the membership that he is leading. In turn, this allows those they lead to learn and grow while bringing their own expertise and vision to the table. Mm -hmm. This hinges on building influence. So a leader, a servant leader has to be able to influence his team. Mm -hmm. Influence and authority rather than using control and toxic leadership. And according to uh, Bishop Kwame, he talked about in one of his sessions, I believe his first session, he spoke about below the line leadership and above the line leadership. <clears throat> very, very powerful concept. So servant leadership is inclusive leadership rather than exclusive leadership. Exclusive leadership says, it's all about what I want as the leader and your ideas could be put on the shelf or you can keep them to yourself. Inclusive leadership means that you are bringing everybody's ideas to the table, fleshing them out and, and, and incorporating them in the overall uh, collection of ideas for the fulfillment of the purpose and the goal. And so when we talk about inclusive leadership, there's one thing uh, when the church talks about inclusive leadership, and then there is another thing when the world speaks of inclusive, um, inclusive leadership. When the world speaks of inclusive leadership, they are also talking about lifestyles and principles that does not necessarily, not, does not necessarily uh, promote uh, biblical standards. And so you have to understand the different terms and how they function in the different areas and, the, and, and, and in the different realms. Kingdom is one thing. When, it, when we say inclusive leadership is a different thing from when the world says it, all right? And I'll, I'll leave that alone for now because I'm very tempted to go into it. So let me narrow this down to, um, I'll bring it home a little bit to, 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 to where we are. In servant leadership, team leaders, team members, or employees, like I said, I would be mentioning employees, are empowered to lead themselves. So it's not just the leader leading, but there's delegation of leadership roles within that team. And you remember Jesus did the same thing. Jesus would send his disciples out and say, go do this or go do that. Especially, you remember that specific event where he was going to need a donkey and he'd send them out. He said, go take care of this. Tell the, the person that I need this coal, uh, this foal to, to take me into, in, into uh, Jerusalem. And so he, he delegated responsibilities to his disciples uh, before he went into certain regions. Um, he would send them ahead of him to prepare the way. Hmm? John the Baptist was a leader. He was sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the way. And so even in our team, we, a servant leadership does not grab all the attention for, for himself or herself, but they delegate. Sometimes you don't even know who the leader is in the team. And that's the kind of thing that Jesus did because when he entered into the garden, uh, into um, the Garden of Gethsemane. They couldn't tell who he was. That's why Judas had to go identify him. But yet he was their leader. Mm -hmm. And so a servant leader encourages or she or he encourages their team to get involved. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we hear people saying, oh, you know, church members don't like to get involved. 
Well, there is a reason why. There is always a reason why. But the servant leader encourages their team to get involved. Uh, leaders must create room for each team member to be able to bring their unique gifts and talents to the table and use them. So in the servant leadership style, the servant leader does not allow anyone to stand on the sidelines or sit on the sidelines and say, you know what, I don't know what to do. Even those people are included. Even those people are influenced to be a part of the team and to bring whatever they have, whether it's in a small uh, way or in a large way, to the table so that it can be used. And so in the style of servant leadership, nobody is on the sidelines. A servant leader is always behind those people, probing them, encouraging them to get involved. Mm -hmm. He knows the skills of each of his team members, and he allows them to bring, it to the, bring those skills to the table. Mm -hmm. The servant leader clearly articulates their vision in detail, in detail to his team members. Mm -hmm. And so in order for you to motivate your team members, you have to be able to articulate what your vision is. Mm -hmm. You have to the one that is labeled slide one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're dealing with unleashing and uh, untapping gifts and talents. So the servant leader is able to find those gifts and bring them out from their team members. If you're leading a team, it is your responsibility to find whatever is inside of them. Find those gifts, probe until you find the gifts inside of them. Because a lot of times members don't know what their gifts are. They just know that they can do stuff, but they, they, they haven't hit the mark. And a lot of times there are people doing stuff that they have no business doing because that's not their gift area. And so the servant leader is able to tap into that person's life, read them well, look at them and find the gifts that are inside of them and not just find it, but allow them to use those gifts. And so a servant leader knows the talents and the gifts of each of his team members. It is his responsibility or her responsibility to know what each of his members or her members bring to the table. You see, you see what we're dealing with in the body of Christ here? When we, when we take the time to focus on people, that is, that is why it's important to be able to focus on people. And not just to watch people come and go in church and not, 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 not engage them. It is very important for leaders to engage the people who are coming and going in their ministry. And if your ministry is a large ministry, thousands of people, um, those ministries grow because they have people who engage each of those people who come to their ministry. And even if it's not genuine, and even if it's just professional, the fact is, is that they're touching those people in some way and putting them in the, in the various groups where their interests are. So let me say, and I want to stick a pin here, that church is the only organization that has the most human resources available to her, but only use 2% of that human resources of that human resource that comes to church. And I'm talking about the people who come to church, the human resource uh, that comes to church that, that is on two legs walking into church in and out. 2% of the gifts that are in those people are being used. The church is the only single entity that has the largest concentration of people with varying gifts and talents, bodies of knowledge, skills and expertise, but yet the church members are not given the opportunity to use those gifts in the kingdom of God. 
And this is what I mean. The church activities are centered around preaching, worship, music, evangelism, ladies' ministry, men's fellowship, and youth ministries. I think I've, I've, I've touched as many as possible. Hospitality, preaching, worship, evangelism, choir. Yet, there are doctors and health professions among us, lawyers, scientists, accountants, mechanics, uh, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, um, fashion designers, real estate pro uh, pro professionals who sit among us every week. Mm -hmm. And those people come and go every Sunday and their expertise remain on top by the church. And I say that is a waste. And so the church activities are centered around specific things, but it's not including all of the other gifts and talents that people have. The current model of operation in the church is come to church, participate in worship, listen to ministry, uh, to teaching, pray and go home. Whilst all the gifts and talents, knowledge and wisdom that God has sent to us in the way of people simply go to waste. We criticize the world for using up the gifts that our people bring and our people have when we ourselves, as the body of Christ, fail to use those gifts that are right there sitting watching us every Sunday. The world, as Jesus said, and the people out there are smarter than the church, smarter than the, the children of light, more wise than the children of light. In Luke chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus says, the, the master commended the, the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And guess what he did? The master, the people owed the master a certain amount of money and he was floatful in his, in, in, in his responsibility. And the master came and found that he hadn't uh, taken up and, and collected those monies. And he went to all of those people and collected less money and brought the money to the master. And the master said, okay, you know, I can accept this. So this wicked servant went out. And even though he didn't do exactly what the master required, he went out there and did his best, the best that he could have to do in his wickedness. And the master considered that to be shrewd. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealings with their own generation than the sons of light. And then Jesus says, you better get some of them for friends because when things fall apart for you, they will help you. So the truth is, that the world is better and more efficient at harnessing the gifts and talents in people and refining them for production, for profit, and for output. Let me read that again. The truth is, the world is better and more efficient at harnessing the gifts and talents in people and refining them for production, for profit, and for output. Output. Ministry gifts, let me say this, are not the only gifts that God has given to people. You know that? They're not the only gifts that he has given to people. Not every person who attends church is tapped for ministry, or tapped for singing, or tapped for for choir, top for evangelism. Not everybody is top for that traditional church activity. Many of them are there to enhance the power of the kingdom, to operate in the marketplaces of the world. Consider Esther, consider Joseph, consider Daniel. Consider Issachar, the sons of Issachar. Many of them are there to enhance the power of the kingdom in business, health, education, science, finances, economics, and, and more. And so these people will not fit into your worship glove 
or your preaching glove or your ladies group glove. And as a result, many of them will come and go, come and go because they cannot find their fit in the traditional ministries that the church has. Mm -hmm. So consider the wisdom of Issachar in our day. The wisdom of, of Issachar would be discarded because the wisdom of Issachar was non-traditional. These people knew what to do in every season. They didn't go by the traditional methods, but they went along looking at every season and what was needed in every season so that the nation of Israel will prosper. All right? And so um, I would love to recommend, and I'm dealing, we're still dealing with servant leadership, and I'm dealing with that aspect where the servant leader finds the gifts and searches out his people and his members for the gifts that are uh, sitting deep on the inside of them and helping those people to come forth and to use those gifts effectively and efficiently. And so I would challenge and recommend that all serious church leaders do a forensic invent inventory of, 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 of the gifts lying dormant dormant in their church members mm? do an inventory i challenge church leaders to do an inventory of all the gifts and i'm talking about documenting these things mm? i challenge every church leader to create a questionnaire and give it uh, and give it out to each of his members including family members that are a part of your ministry as well and have every, everyone write down their gifts and talents. Have them also write down the ones that they have mastered and the ones that they are proficient in. Mm -hmm. Do an audition with them. We're talking about finding gifts in people. Mm -hmm. Do an audition with them to really find out if the gifts they, that they say they have, that they really do have them. Mm -hmm. I remember I went to this one church and they wanted to know if I could sing. And they actually did an audition with me. These were serious people. They were not, not going to let anybody go up there and croak. And so they did an audition and I passed it. Hmm? And that's the only way that you could have gotten into that uh, um, worship team. You had to be able to sing. Hmm? So do an audition with them to find out if this is the, the gift that they really say they have, that they have it. Hmm? And document that. That, that, that gift. Document those, those questionnaires. Put them in, in chronological form so that when you look at the members that you have, you know wh where each one of them is. You know what their gifts, what their talents are. You know exactly uh, what, to, what resources they bring to the table. Mm? There are so many people that have come and gone out of church and, and nobody knows what they can do because nobody asks them. Instead, the leadership is expecting the people to come and ask. Mm -hmm. When the process is done, you bring all those people together. I remember uh, there was one time when, at the time when, when, when I was leaving school, we used to have these work study programs. And at that time, my school was excluded from the work study program. And I remember my teacher, I never forget his name, Michael Diabu. He, he called us together, all of us. It was about 60 of us, young people who had just come out of, <clears throat> excuse me, fifth form. We had no place to go. We had no work study program to do during the summertime. And he said, he grouped us together. Those who can do art, who are creative, he put them together. Those in the science, those in the um you know arts and all of that and he grouped us together i think he had about five to six groups and then each of us we started writing down the places that we can go to and let me tell you that was the most um successful uh work study program that we had even though it was initiated by us mm -hmm. He said, you can draw, you can do this, you can do that. You go to designs and graphics, you go to this place, you go to that place. 
a lot of people who are in the electrical engineering stuff, they went to uh, GPL at that time. I don't know what is the name now. And different people went to different places. And let me tell you something. Every one of us remained in the field that we left, that, 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 that we had the work study program in. All of the friends that I, I, you know, I contact long after, it's been many years, we are still in those fields because there was a strategic planning that was done to get us into the places where our skills were best uh, um, needed and where we can ex uh, expedite those skills efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so the church is one of the places where this does not happen. I want to challenge you and I want you to think right now, do you know all of the skills that your members bring. Do you know, apart from the fact that they, they sing in the worship group, apart from the fact that they are, um, you know, treasurer or, or, or preacher or whatever, do you know anything else that they, they can do? And therein lies the reason why sometimes we have uh, the harvest being ripe and the lab laborers being few. The laborers are inefficient because they're placed in, in, they're put in places and to do things that a lot of times that they, they that's not even where their gifts are. Hmm. And so we complain that people are not involved in ministry and ministry activities and the ministry activities of the church. But the point is that oftentimes the membership is disinterested and does not see any opportunity to use their gifts. Servant leadership, servant leaders are, give, uh, are gifts and talent hunters. They are talent recruiters. They go out there and they find the gifts. They look, they're always looking for people who have expertise that they can bring onto their team. Servant leaders are not insecure about the gifted people within their team. They understand that they are not the only person with ideas. They understand that their team members as well has ideas that are valuable and can be used. And so servant leaders are passionate about building elite teams comprising of sometimes raw talent raw gifts and raw talent that they can train and watch blossom forth. And so servant leaders are king makers. They open the door to greatness for others to walk through. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very powerful, powerful style of leadership that deals not just with output and getting things done, but also it deals with simultaneously developing the people in the team and so that is why you know jesus had 12 disciples and after that the rest is history mm -hmm. so let's go to slide two number two and so uh leadership must be effective servant leadership must be effective leadership mm -hmm. and Servant leadership is always, is unafraid to uh, allow others to be in charge. Mm -hmm. So in, in its ineffective, uh, in, in, in servant leaders' effective style, it is unafraid or those leaders are unafraid to allow others to lead or to put, uh, put others ahead to lead. Mm -hmm. And so ineffective leadership or leaders are actually afraid of not allowing others to lead. Mm -hmm. They are unafraid, they, they are, are actually afraid of putting people ahead in the leadership. You know, and it, it, this is the thing that they are afraid that, that, that these people and the, the leaders that they have among them may, may steal their thunder. Mm -hmm. They're afraid that, oh, you know, this person might, people might like this person more. It's a Saul and David kind of thing, you know? And so these leaders who are not afraid, they're afraid because a lot of times uh, the people who are among them 
are, are sometimes more gifted than they are, and that is fine. That is perfectly fine because servant leadership looks for people who are even better than them and bring them on the team so that the team would be enhanced. Mm -hmm. And so even with Jesus leading, we see, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, Jesus wasn't a tax collector. He wasn't a treasurer. He went about preaching and, and doing what he was supposed to do, whilst all of the other guys who knew how to do other things, they did what they were supposed to do. And so the group was effective because everybody had their responsibility to, to, to do and they got it done. Mm -hmm. Insecure leadership creates an atmosphere where everyone is scared to bring their ideas to the table because only pastor or only leader or only, only the boss has ideas. Fearful leaders are insecure leaders. Insecure leaders have ego issues. Leaders with ego, ego issues are emotionally unfit to handle the rigors of ministry and growing a ministry. And so I remember I was talking about this, this situation recently. And that, you know, we ran an after school program and the kids would come to the after school program that's after they leave school. And they would say, um, uh, Ms. Vonda, my teacher has issues. And I would say, what do you mean? You're being disrespectful to your teacher? And they say, no, 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 teacher has issues. And one day I sat down and I sat them down. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they said, you know, uh, Miss gets angry. Uh, 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 and Miss chases us out of the class. And, and Miss behaves uh, like she's off her meds. And you know how kids talk. And, but when I found out what was going on, that there was a specific teacher and there was a specific, uh, a few of them who were not doing well emotionally. They were, they, they were harsh and very, very uh, tough with the kids. And so the kids would come and say, they didn't know how to explain it. All they knew was that to say, Miss has issues. And I think I spoke about that this morning. Oh, Miss has issues. My, my teacher has issues. And so issues are real stuff. <laughs> People having issues are real. And oh boy, talk about leadership that can bring those issues to the forefront. And we're talking about uh, dealing with the rigors of leadership. And sometimes it can become very, very difficult. And all of the things that are on the inside of you can come to the front. And most often, uh, uh, what you call um, jealousy and fear and insecurity comes to the forefront because there are people around you that you're leading that sometimes have a lot more confidence than you have a lot more, uh, 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 if they're much more effective and efficient than you as the leader. And sometimes people like them more than you. What are you going to do? Hmm? You're going to get jealous and run them and try to spare them like Saul? Hmm? So as a matter of fact, these leaders are very unfruitful. However, it is the people, and you will find this in a lot of ministries, a lot of times uh, the pastor and the leader of the church are the, the worst things that, that could ha happen to that ministry. But the ministry survives, why? Because there are people on that team hmm, who are, are invested in the work. And so they press in and they get the work done. And people think it's the pastor doing it. It's not the pastor. It's those people that he has around him who have bought into the ministry and they, 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 they take on that, that vision as their own and they love the people in the ministry. And a lot of times they are more effective than the pastor. And many times when those people leave the ministry, when they are, there, when they are not there anymore, that's when things start fall apart. That's when things uh, crumble. That's when you realize that, 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 oh, since it's the so-and-so left and since brother so-and-so left, the thing is not the same anymore. And when they leave, other people leave as well, not because they're taking other people with them, 
but they were the live wire in the ministry because the pastor, the leader didn't do anything to work on himself or herself. They took things for granted and they remain as rotten as ever without growing, without stretching themselves, without becoming all that God wanted them to become. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it is time for change, people. It is time for change. If you see that you need some work, you know, you're not performing in the way that you're supposed to perform, your leadership is lacking, get help, get training, go do some courses, go find people who, who know about leadership and who can teach you and apply yourself, apply yourself to change, build capacity for leadership. Because leading is about leading people. It's not about leading rocks or leading uh, sheep. <laughs> Even sheep don't tolerate nonsense. <laughs> Even goats don't tolerate nonsense. And why should the people you're leading tolerate foolishness? And so a servant leader leaders are able to, one, find, and two, refine the gifts talents and expertise of their team members. And so that, uh, in such a way that they give them opportunity to use those gifts and benefits and, uh, uh, in the ministry and in the organization that they were part of. So let's go to slide three. So what are, uh, are some areas that uh, servant uh, leaders folk focus on? What are some of those areas that they focus on? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go through um, a few of those areas that they focus on right now. Mm -hmm. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11, it says, uh, without a vision, the people perish. And so number one, Servant leaders focus on the vision. Hmm? The mark of a servant leader is he or she has a clearly defined vision and can articulate their vision verbally and in document uh, in document form as well. And so, you know, there is this um, program that I used to watch, and these business owners will have to go into an elevator and I think the elevator would go for two floors like would go either up and up or up and down up or down for two floors and in that short space of time they were supposed to pitch their business and make the investor understand what their business was all about and so here comes the phrase, the elevator pitch. So these business owners, and this was a serious program, these business owners had to understand and, are, and, 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 and know their vision so well inside out that in, in a few lines, which is five sentences or six sentences, they would be able to articulate and pitch that, have that elevator pitch and pitch it to an investor that is standing in the elevator. And if that investor is convinced that he has gotten a clear picture of what this business owner is, is uh, product and service is all about, then he would consider investing in that company. And so the mark of a servant leader is he or she has a clearly defined vision and can articulate their vision verbally and in document form as well. Can you do that? Those of you who are aspiring leaders, those of you who are leaders watching this program, if somebody asks you right now, what is your vision? Can you in five sentences or less, tell them what the vision is and convince them that your vision is worth paying attention to? So um, have you written down your vision? Do you have your vision in document form? And somebody says, could you send me your vision? I need to know the vision of your company. I love what you're doing, but could you send me 
your vision? Can you, do you have it ready? You should be able to go into your phone because these phones are, are high tech these days. You must be able to go into your phone, click, 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 and in less than 30 seconds, that's how the world works that we're working in. In less than 30 seconds, you must be able to send that vision out to uh, the person who wants to take a look at it. And guess what? A lot of people have lost out on, on valuable investments because when the person asked them for their vision, they were not going to write it. <laughs> They were not going to write it's like oh <laughs> so fluttering and, and they they don't know they're not coming up with it and that is one of the most annoying things to investors they will walk away from you and never ever look at your stuff again because you are not serious and so can you articulate that vision hmm? can you relate the vision clearly to the people that you're leading hmm? Do they understand what your vision is for your ministry? Do they understand the direction that you are going, that you're taking the ministry in? Or is, or is it just come to church and go home, come to church and go home, sing a few songs, fall on the floor, lay some olive oil on the people and go home? That's not a purpose. That's not a vision. That's why your ministry will not grow. Uh, I'm sorry to say it like that. But you have to have a vision. What do you want to see happen in the next four years, in the next five years of your ministry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or are you one of those leaders who expect your membership or your members or your team leaders to just know your vision by osmosis? Oh, yeah, man, you just, you know what I'm about. No, nobody knows what you're about. You expect your team members to just know your vision by telepathy. You know, it's like we just communicating. That doesn't work. You have to be able to either verbally, as a matter of fact, both verbally and uh, in document form, relate your vision to anyone you meet. Mm -hmm. And if you as a leader, if you do not have a vision or your vision is not, do not documented as well, uh, or, or your vision is not documented or you cannot clearly articulate your vision to your team. How do you expect them to have a sense of direction in your ministry? How do you have to expect them to have a sense of direction to, to, to build the ministry with you? Because you don't know your vision and they don't understand what you're doing. And so there's the, everybody's confused. The blind is leading the blind. And so it is to the leader's ad, uh, disadvantage if his team does not know his vision. And as we said before, a sign of poor leadership is when the leader refuses to take responsibility for his own failure and blames his team member or his team, his team players for it. Oh, they don't understand what I'm doing, but have you sat them down and have you constantly articulated that vision to them? Sometimes you have to tell people one thing 200 times before it really gets into their spirit. And it's not a, you know, some, a flaw with them. It's just that sometimes something that is coming from somebody else has to be said over and over and over again before people actually can feel it and get it. Hmm? And so you will have to speak your vision over and over and over again before people actually get it and run with it. Mm -hmm. And so the servant leader encourages his team to take ownership of his vision. When a vision is practically walked out, then people can see all the different parts of it. In essence, it is not the leader's vision, but everyone's vision everyone having a sense of ownership. <clears throat> in Habakkuk 2, 2 to 3, it's, uh, it says, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. It may be activated by the one who reads it. 
it might, the one who reads it would take ownership and be motivated to act on that vision. That's what it means. The one who reads it would be a, a, a continuance of that vision. Hmm? That's what the word means. And then verse three, it says, for still the vision waits. If nobody can run with the vision, it will stay there until somebody picks it up. Uh, it, it waits for its, for its appointed time. It hastens to the, uh, to the end. It will not lie and so on and so on. And so write it down, flesh it out, attach goals to it, to it. attach systems and, and, and standards and protocols to your vision so that your vision will come alive, people. Nothing happens if you do nothing. Nothing changes if you do nothing. If, you're, if, if, if your vision is, on the, is, is in the phone only and, and you have all the documents and you do nothing about it, if you don't articulate that vision to your team, it goes nowhere. It stands still. It's dead. It is only active when somebody picks it up and runs with it. Set benchmarks and deadlines to the fulfillment of your goals attached to your vision. Communicate them clearly to your team. Habakkuk said, uh, in Habakkuk it says, write it down. And then God says, you gotta be able to write it in such a way that when people see it, they would understand it. It means that you have to write it legibly and clearly. It has to be articulated clearly. This is not a happenstance thing. This is not a scribbling down on a, on a, paper, on a paper tissue. You know, people say, well, you know, he wrote his vision down on a, on a paper tissue and it became a big vision. No, it didn't happen like that. It started on a paper tissue. But then it went to to uh, eight by uh, eight by eight and a half by eleven uh, paper, and then it was documented in the computer, and then a team was formed, and then the team ran with the vision, and things started happening. So it didn't come from a paper napkin to a two billion dollars business. Come on, people, this is not magical thinking. <laughs> no magical thinking here. And so servant leaders make sure that the team has uh, the vision clearly laid out for them so that that team will not have any ambiguity about what is, what is required of them to do. Uh, let's move on a little. Uh, servant leaders make sure that their team has the required resources uh, budget, skills, and attention to make do uh, to make the job that they're doing uh, effective, to get results from the job that they're doing. And so, when your leadership is pharaonic or pharaoh, it, it it means like you you're you're sort of a pharaoh, hmm? and that word is. Is Pharaoh like you're spelling Pharaoh, P H A R A O N I C, Pharaonic? You will expect your team to produce results without providing the necessary resources your team needs. Hmm. And I'm going here tonight. I am going to this because this happens a whole lot in the church. Pharaoh expected the, the Hebrews to provide uh, blocks without giving them the resources to get the work done. And many times in the church, you have the Christmas pageant, you have the Christmas party, you have the Sunday school uh, children party, you have all sorts of big events happening. And the, the, the people are not given any resources. Everything is expected by the members to get the resources and produce this big event. And when the thing doesn't come off the way it's supposed to come off, they're blamed. But the church itself never gave them anything. Their leaders did not give them anything 
to help uh, you know, offset the cost of this big event. As a matter of fact, church has a lot of magical thinking. They want fantastic events done and they want things to happen in a, in, in, in a very effective and efficient way. But very, so very often, those leaders and, and the board and the churches do not give their members any resources to get the work done. And that is unfair. Hmm? That is unfair. And so the challenge is that effective servant leaders make sure that they find and they, they have innovative ways to come up with resources so that their team will be adequately outfitted to get the job done. They will be provided with the resources they need to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And so here we are where church members are given responsibilities to get things done. And a lot of times they do it and they do it well. But guess what? After that, after they have put their hands in their pockets and they, they, they pull off a huge event, nobody asks where the money came from which bank account it came out from or anything like that. And yet they're expected to give tithe, give seed, give a uh, love offering, give a ministry gift. Give. How, how are you going to get all of that done? And you have not given the people any resources. You have not gone into the, the church's bank account to help the people produce this big event, you're expecting everybody to put their hands in. And every time these big events are planned, the church makes sure that they lean heavily on the people. Servant leadership is not like that. Servant leadership considers the resources that, 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 that the people bring and make sure that their teams are properly outfitted they're proper, properly a resource so that these big events or whatever they're planning comes off smoothly and they're, they're not putting a burden on their team members. Hmm? Let's go to just a few scriptures as we run down. Jesus provided food uh, for, and he fed 5,000. Matthew chapter uh, 14, verse 13. 21 Jesus provided money coin in the fish mouth Matthew chapter 17 verse 24 to 27 uh, he provided shelter place for, for, for mm -hmm. rest uh, on their ministry journey John chapter 3 verse 1 to 21 uh, he provided knowledge he never held back from teaching them uh, he provided training. He always had, uh, you know, in-house training, so to speak, uh, with his disciples. Mark chapter 14, verse 13. And he provided investment, uh, net-breaking investment, even though it was a miracle. It was net-breaking. Luke chapter 5, verse 9, 1 to 9. Servant leaders provide a framework within which their team can flourish instead of just handing out specific directions on each of their duties. And so uh, we, we, I spoke about this a little bit earlier and I'm coming back to it. They provide a framework and that's where the vision comes in. The vision creates a framework so that they will be able to effectively perform their duty. And it's not just about, um, you know, getting a leaflet or, or a stack of responsibility, but it's more about creating a framework so that they will be able to do their work and do it effectively. Everyone knows their duty. However, the entire team interacts and shares their knowledge and resources to produce the vision and so the servant leader leads from the bottom up 
they empower those team members. It's like they're sitting on their shoulders and they push them upward. <clears throat> we have leaders in the church and leaders out there who want to be the top dog in their team. They want to be the one who everybody speaks about. Whenever the accolades are given out, it's all about the, the, the um, you know, the leader of the team. And, and, and a lot of times you hear it, you know, in the sports, um, in the sports arena. Oh, you know, uh, this one scored 200 points or this one scored 50 points and, and he won the match. But, but you don't hear about the seven other people that assisted that, that person mm, to score all those points. There is no talk of the people who supported the star athlete. There is no talk of the, of the people or the team members who caused that coach to be coach of the year. There is no recognition of the CEO, uh, of the people who served uh, underneath the CEO. Hmm? But all you hear about is the leader. Hmm? But the servant leadership leaders, they elevate their own people. If you are honoring a servant leader, you would know you would know them by heart. They go up there and they begin to talk about the people who helped and very little about themselves. They give honor to all the people around them who 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 caused the vision to come alive. <clears throat> and in doing so, they're elevating those people. Elevating them, moral, elevating them morally and spiritually. And this is what we need. And, and tonight I'm really being very methodical about the way I'm not getting into any hype because this is a very sober issue in the church. It's something that should be dealt with very soberly. There is no hype and fluff and 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 what you call it, float parade about leadership. Leadership is a very, very serious thing because it can destroy or it can elevate and empower people. And, and, and what we have been hearing, like we talked about in the beginning of this program, there is a major deficit in leadership in the world today. And so leaders, servant leaders lead from the bottom up and they push their team. Hmm? There's a specific person that I know who's a leader and everyone who comes out from that person's leader, uh, um, uh, um, team, team, all of his team members, even if they move on to other places and to other jobs, everybody wants them because he produces the best and he is noted for that. And that's one of the most poignant servant leaders that I have ever seen. This person, anybody who comes from his team, anyone who comes from his team, everybody wants them because they are the best. He produces the best leaders. And so this is uh, one of the, the mark of a servant leader. Mm -hmm. The people under him, or her benefit. Mm? They're not insecure about their leadership. Huh? They're very, very uh, concerned about the, the, the people who are under them. They care about the people who are under their leadership. <clears throat> and so let's look, I think I have a few minutes more, about 20 minutes. Let's look at a few principles of servant leadership. And we can go to the next one. Let's look at a few principles of servant leadership. One of the most important principles of servant leadership is they listen. Mm, they, lis they listen. They are wonderful listeners. And, and let me say this. You're not born a servant leader. You have to develop. You have to grow. You have to build capacity for it. It's not something that you just wake up tomorrow and it's like, oh, I'm a servant leader. You know, I, I'm so wonderful. No, 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 no. 
servant leader is all, is all about character and building character and it evolves. You evolve as a servant leader as you build character. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the, the marks and one of the principles of servant leadership is listening. It's important to fully listen to the members of your team without interrupting. Have you ever seen an egotistical leader listen to one of his team members? It's a slap down, it's a shut up. It's you don't talk to me, I am speaking. You know, what do you have to say? Whatever I say goes. Not so with the servant leader. He or she, have de they have developed the ability to listen and not interrupt. And sometimes it's, it's, it's one of the things that rubs your patience because sometimes the person is going round and round, buffering, buffering, buffering. But you have to have the patience. Hmm? One of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that all uh, servant leaders must have and our leaders must have is patience. Let's move to the next one, empathy. It is important to get to know your team members so that you can empathize with them because people will come to work people will come to church people will come to your team with a lot of issues things that are happening in their lives can you empathize with them hmm? can you empathize with them and in the midst of them going through their personal tragedy tragedies that they can also grow even in those times they can look at those situations from a different perspective not from a perspective where you know, oh, this thing has come to hurt me. Oh, there's so many demons on my head, demons living in my house, demons, demons. But you have to be able to show them a different perspective, people, because you're a servant leader. Hmm? You have to be able to bring a different focus because if you go on the, 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 the bag wagon with them, telling them, oh, yes, demons are coming after you, guess what will happen? Eventually, they're not going to come to work. Eventually, they will believe the nonsense. And if so, the demons are coming after them. How are you going to show it? Are you going to show them that they are powerful and they're mightier and that they can overcome all of that? Hmm? Healing. You have to be able to minister the healing balm to your members. Hmm? You have to be able to help them through situations because in leadership and as they go through life, things will happen to them and they will be hurt. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the world is recognizing that when people are traumatized and when people have issues and when people go through things in their lives, that they need therapy. And guess what they're doing out there? When their workers go through stuff, there is a therapy room that they go and they seek therapy. They have on-call therapists on the job these days. So people can go and sit with the therapist, albeit a lot of them are not believers. But the fact is, is that they recognize that people do better when they can express and articulate their pain and their hurt. Healing, healing, healing. And for you who, 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 who is a believer and you are a servant leader so you know you believe in the principles of the word of god and all of that this is something that you must do mm -hmm. self-awareness eh? servant leader is, is very self-aware as well as he encourages he or she encourages his team members to be self-aware themselves as a servant leader you must also recognize your own strengths and weaknesses and also encourage your team members to recognize their strengths and their weaknesses. I know where my strengths and weaknesses are. I know when people get, get to me in a certain way what to do, to get out of that place or, you know, and there are some areas where I'm not dealing with it too well too. You know, I still have to grow and become stronger in many many areas in my life mm -hmm. uh self-aware can i find the other one okay uh let's move on to the next one because i'm coming down i have 14 minutes left 
Uh, the next one is conceptualization. Servant leaders need to be able to use the big picture thinking. A lot of times we see things through narrow lens, you know, things fell apart in this area and all we can see is that things fell apart. But you have to be able on a broader scale to conceptualize things and look at the bigger picture, have a big picture thinking. And with this, you can conceptualize plans for the future, thinking ahead, going beyond your failure. Because a lot of times you will have failure in your team, no matter how big and bad and efficient your team is. There are times when there will be colossal failure. But the more you're able to overcome those, those failures, the more you're able to step over them and keep moving. Hmm? It is a it's it it is the better that your team, you and your team will become. But if you cannot conceptualize beyond your failure, you can't move beyond where you are, then you know what will happen? Your team will not move beyond that failure. As a matter of fact, every time you go to board meetings, there are those team members that will remind you, you see, we failed down there already. Why are you going back there again? We failed already. We can't go back there. That's a place of failure. But if you can look beyond that as a leader and lead your team beyond the failure, go back to that same place and win again and move forward, then your, your leadership, you as a servant leader, will be very, very effective. And then there's foresight. It is important to use what you and your team learn to improve for the future, like I just said. The two are equally uh, joined together. Foresight, can you see in the future? Can you look forward into the future and see that things will work out? What about stewardship that the word of God speaks about? Hmm? All of us are called to stewardship. Hmm? Each team member, how do, you, how do you deal with your time? Hmm? Are you always late? Are you turning out, showing up for everything late? You late? You're the leader. You're late. You you, you can imagine what the what the what what your members would do. Hmm? You're opening the door eight eight uh, um, eight thirty, and the and the service is supposed to start eight at eight o'clock. You're opening the office, and the office is supposed to be open, uh, you know, twenty minutes before, and 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 you're exactly what you do is what your team members will do. And if you set a standard as a, a, a servant leader, you set a high standard, guess what? Your team members will come up and meet that standard. And we are not talking about a tyrannical attitude here where, you know, oh, you know, we're scared. We're scared because um, boss man is going to get us if we come late. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people, your team members, taking respons responsibility because they see the benefit in it. They see the personal benefit in it. They're growing themselves. They're becoming better at what, they, what they're doing. A commitment to the growth of the people. Hmm? We're talking here about the principles of servant leadership. A, a servant leader is committed to the growth of the people, and we, we talked a lot about that earlier, so I don't need to belabor that, belabor that point. Uh, what about building community? And when we talk about building community here, we're not talking about going out into the community and harnessing people and building them and bringing them together. We're, we're talking about building an environment, establishing an environment of, of commu a communal environment within your team where everybody works with each other. Hmm? I have seen teams in church that are shared chaos. Ooh. You don't want to be a part of those teams because everybody's sniping at each other. Everybody's pulling off, everybody is pulling off each other's wigs. Talk about those ladies group. They grab, I mean, not literally pulling off the, each other's wigs, but the, the, proverbially, it's, it's a 
sniping and they're gossiping and all of that. And, and in the men's group too. Mm -hmm. And so you want to create, as a servant leader, you want to create an atmosphere where people care about each other. You, you have a zero tolerance for gossiping. You have a zero tolerance for, for, for people being cruel and mean to each other. No, we don't do that here. One strike, two strike, and you're out of this team if that is your modus operandi. And so you as the team leader, you have to create a communal spirit. You have to set the atmosphere. You have to set the environment so that people would understand. And once you're coming into this team, you, the, the principle, you got to be kind. You have to have a good nature. You have to be gentle. You have to be patient. All of that. And so even if, excuse me, these people are coming in and they don't have patience and they don't have kindness as yet just being in that environment changes them amen all right i have a couple more minutes to go and i have a whole load of stuff left to talk about mm. and let's go to the characteristics of servant leadership now we're getting down to some of the you know meatier things mm. and last the last time i talked about I showed you examples of servant leadership. I showed you Jesus. I showed you uh, Moses. But here we are. We're talking about the practical part of servant leadership. And one of the, fly, um, the, the flyers, one of those flyers that I did not remember to tell um, Bassanio to put up was the fact that servant leadership is practical. You walk it out. There's nothing sentimental about it. It's not romance. It's, it's not romantic. It's a practical thing. It's like jogging, you know? You feel the burn. You feel the burn in your limbs. Yeah, that's it. Uh, servant leadership 101, it's practical. You got to walk it out until you feel, until you become proficient at it. And so let's go back to uh, the characteristics of servant leadership and so servant leadership is about empowering your team and helping create a positive environment like i just said if you have somebody coming into your team cuddling and putting mud and throwing mud all over the place with their gossip and their foolishness you have to get that person out sometimes they might be very very good at what they do they're one of the most gifted team members but they have very, very poor communication skills. They're always in a fight. They're fighting with everybody. It's either they change or they leave. And so it's about empowering your team and helping create a positive environment. Does church need a positive environment? Yes, they do. So what does this actually look like? And so let's break it down. And I'm going to go through this very quickly because I have five minutes left. Let's break it down and see if we can get through the seven um, aspects of um, uh, the seven characteristics of, of servant leadership. Teamwork. Teamwork. Hey, people. Teamwork. In servant leadership and the teams that servant leadership uh, builds and servant leaders build, there is no place where one team member can say, I don't want to work with her. You know, my spirit don't take her. I don't like her. You don't like her, you can leave. Teamwork. Everybody works together. So there is nobody telling this person, this person say, I don't like, I don't, no, if you don't like this person, number one, it's called a team. And so if you don't like somebody, you're the odd man out. You got to deal with all of your issues, all of those issues that you're bringing, all the baggage that you're bringing to the team, you got to drop it. You got to work on it so that you can be a team player. That's how I like. Uh, you know, we say teamwork makes the dream work. 
All right. And, and then we have team satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Employees or team satisfaction and cooperation turns the wheel when the team is satisfied. When the team has a sense of satisfaction that, you know, this thing that we're doing, it's working. We're seeing results. That's when the team is more motivated to work together. Mm -hmm. But when you have one person failing and you're allowing this person to fail and you're allowing that person to fail and you're demanding that these other, other people over here that they produce, there is no fairness. There is no moral um, uh, compass when you're dealing with your team members. You're not fair. You're, you're biased. Mm -hmm. Your team is dissatisfied. And they're, 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 they're morally put down because you are not fair. You, 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 they're, they're dissatisfied because you're not leading in the way that you're supposed to lead. Hmm? Adaptability, servant leaders vary from revenue focus, from tight focus, from fundraising uh, focus and sales uh, to promoting the overall goal of the team. And so the team has to be able to adapt from focusing on, on, on just uh, bringing in money or bringing in production or bringing in results to making sure that just, not just that they're getting results, but also the people who, who are serving in the team that they're also benefiting from the process of your leadership. Let's talk about motivation. I'm going down, I have a few more to go. Motivation, servant leaders provide high level of support to their team, to their employees, fueling motivation and engagement. And so you have to be able to motivate your team. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't ask nobody to motivate his people. He sat with them and he poured into them. And we see the results today. Let's move on. Uh, let's move on to the other slide. Uh, transparent communication. The team trusts a leader who can provide clear communication to the team. The team trusts a leader who can provide clarity, even in complex changing situations. Mm -hmm. If you as a leader, when things change or something doesn't go right, you fall apart and then you're whispering in your office, uh, you know, this one didn't do it right. You're whispering to, to one particular member that you favor, you know, this one, I, I didn't like what she did and she's the reason and he's the reason. Mm -hmm. Your team will not trust you because you're not transparent. You're not being honest about uh, anything that is happening in your team. You don't have the guts as the leader to stand and face your team and articulate your feelings or what you see as the failures and also bring solutions to those problems. Mm -mm -mm. Authenticity. We're coming down. We're almost there. Authenticity. Servant leaders need to genuinely care about individuals and team development. And so it's not just about people producing and it's not just about, about people bringing their gifts to the table, but you must also want to see those people develop in their own personal lives. Leadership must be able to embrace authenticity. You have to genuinely care. It's not just about saying that you care, but you have to genuinely care about people and demonstrate those traits to prove that you care. And then finally, accountability. Ownership activates uh, commitment and purpose. When you as the leader take responsibility for anything that goes wrong, as well as for things that go right, you are demonstrating that you are committed to the purpose, 
and you're committed to the goals that you have set along with your team. Employees or teams or ministry teams work towards, work towards the goal, their goals that they have set for themselves and they take responsibility for the results. And so if you as a team uh, leader, as a servant leader, you do not have personal accountability. You do not, you do not take your people will not take responsibility for anything that is happening in the team along with them. So they will be disrespectful to you. They will not uh, uh, take responsibility for anything that is happening in the team because you are not taking responsibility. And so these are the principles of servant leadership. These are the principles that uh, I mean, the characteristics that we are looking for in servant leadership. And I know that I have given a whole lot tonight, but some really got to... You really have to be able to pack it in so people can understand in a block of teaching exactly what the whole thing is about. Sometimes when you break it off in bite size, sizes, they don't get the whole thing. But when you give it sometimes in the length, and I know Apostle likes to do, he like he loves to do that. Sometimes people, sometimes you have to do it in that way so that people get a clear understanding of the square foot, the square footage of what you're trying to say. And so that concludes my session tonight on servant leadership. And I trust tonight that you understand those of you who are already leaders and those of you who are inspiring leaders, that you understand how serious this thing is. It's not a romance. It's not, um, it's not magical thinking. It's very practical and it's very raw. And so thank you for listening. May God continue to bless you. May God continue to strengthen you and bring you all into a place of effective leadership, effective servant leadership. Over to you, Apostle. Well, well, we are grateful to God for all of the practical aspects of leadership that we heard about tonight. And I know that uh, we have been challenged. Practicality is not something that is very em much embraced by the church. We like to have it out in the spooky world somewhere, but to bring mm -hmm. it down to the place where, as the man said, Reverend, you got to bring it down to brass tacks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what he meant was, Show us how we can make it work. Show us how, how. We want to know yes. the how. How does this thing work? Well, tonight was one of those times when we saw how the thing works, how, how leadership works, how servant leadership works. I know that you will have been challenged. I know that you have been stretched. And we give God the praise tonight for Apostle Gaspar. We are sorry that uh, uh, she has made tonight one of those nights where she's going to just lay it all on the floor and then leave us panting for more. <laughs> but we are saying to God be the glory. We will work with what we know. We will work with the information that has been given to us so that you would know that our labor of love tonight was not in vain. And then when she sees us Im imparting and practicing the practicalities of the teaching, she would say, all right, I can, I can, um, I can give you a session, another session. <laughs> I'm reaching out here. Oh, God, have yes, mercy. Yes, yes. What a blessing tonight was. It was a blessing to me. I got two pages of notes that I'm going to go over and see what the Lord will say to me. I know he spoke to me on two occasions on, during the message already. And something that I have been planning, and I heard her mention it tonight, I said to myself, boy, you on the right track. Just implement, mm -hmm. implement, implement. Don't wait anymore. So on Sunday, we'll be implementing one of those thoughts and ideas. I'll, of course, claim all credits for it. <laughs> while, while I was in my prayer room, the Lord spoke to amen. me. Amen. Yes, he did. Do this. Do this. Amen and amen. Father, we want to thank you tonight. We are grateful yes. for your new servant. We are grateful for all of the efforting. We know that a lot of effort 
went into putting this together and bringing it out with such clarity and simplicity that the people of God can understand and then put into practice. Because we know, as we have said before, your word is not for entertainment, but for application. And that we will make this word become flesh and we will see it dwelling among us that the culture will change and reflect what we have learned tonight. That we will not be like the man that watches his face in a mirror and then immediately forgets what manner of man he is. But we will take the steps necessary to tweak things and to make it work so that all things will work together for good. To them that love God and are the call according to his purpose. We are grateful tonight. May blessings and strength be upon Apostle Gaspar. We thank you for the effort. We thank you for the outpouring of information and we could tell that her heart was in it. This is not just something out there to make an impression, but it is to impact the body of Christ. And for this, we are eternally grateful. May a blessing be upon her home and answer her prayer. Whatever the particular needs are, let God arise. Let his angelic host visit. Let the yes. enemy be scattered. Yes. Do what only you can do. And we will forever be grateful and careful to give you the praise. Yes. To the glory of God, we thank you for answering us tonight. If you have ever answered us before. Yes. In Yeshua's mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you very much, Apostle Gaspar. Thank you for your effort, for your sacrifice, and for your labor of love with us tonight. We are grateful for the teaching. God bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank and you, thank you. See you on Monday night again for another leadership training. Have a good one, y'all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.